Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Garrett, and I work on the Trusted Execution team here at Apple. And today we're here to talk all about notarization. Here's a quick agenda for the talk. We're going to start with a brief overview of what notarization is and some of the benefits that it provides. Then we're going to talk about the application requirements to get your software notarized. And then finally, we'll run through the workflows and tools that you'll need to use to notarize your software. So let's get started. What exactly is notarization? Well, it's a process that we introduced last year at WWDC to help identify and block malicious software prior to distribution. Now, it's an extension of the developer ID program, which means that you don't need to register for anything different or use different certificates, which also means that you stay in control of signing and distribution of your software just like you did before notarization was introduced. Now, the key to this is the notary service, which performs automated security checks on developer ID signed content. So let's run through a little bit about what the workflow looks like when you need to start notarizing your software for the first time. Now, here's a diagram that talks a little bit about what the development workflow can look like. And local development remains completely unchanged. You build and sign at your desk using your Apple developer certificates until you have a release candidate. At that point, you sign the software with your developer ID certificate, and you can send a copy of it to the Apple Notary Service for notarization. When notarization is complete and successful, the notary service can send back a ticket, which you staple to your software prior to distribution. And once it's stapled, the software is ready for distribution, just like you did before. Now, it's worth calling out that this workflow didn't change at all from last year, so this is just a bit of a refresher. Now, what we didn't talk about last year was what happens when someone downloads your software and uses it for the first time. So when a user downloads your stapled software and double-click it to launch it, Gatekeeper will perform a verification. It'll check the local ticket, and it will also reach out to the notary service via CloudKit to check for a ticket also. As long as the ticket checks out, and the ticket matches the content of your app, Gatekeeper will allow the application, and the user will see the normal first launch prompt. Now, I want to remind everyone that notarization is not an app review. The notary service performs a set of automated security checks. Now, last year, we made a goal to get most responses back from the notary service within an hour. And it actually turns out that over the last year, 99% of submissions have had an answer back within 15 minutes. Also, the status of the notary service is now on Apple's public status page. So you can easily check to see if there are any service problems that would, that would cause problems. Now, what are the benefits to notarization? Well, there are many of them. So I'm just going to highlight a few of them today. First, the notary service can help prevent you from inadvertently shipping a malicious dependency. Second, apps with the hardened runtime are more secure by default. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. That can help prevent your app from being abused by attackers. Third, users are more likely to download and try new software, knowing that Apple has scanned it for known security issues. And finally, notarization also provides an audit trail of software notarized by your developer ID account that you can use to check the submission history and ensure that software hasn't been released that you didn't intend to release from your account. So that's a little bit of an overview of notarization. Now let's bring up Robert to talk about the application requirements to notarize your software. Robert? So to start, I want to say that uh, for any of the software that you previously distributed, it doesn't have to meet any new requirements. You can submit your, new soft, or your existing distributed software for notarization as is without change. But for new software, uh, you need to make sure that it meets a, a few security requirements. In particular, it has to be completely incorrectly signed, 
and it needs to adopt the hardened runtime. Uh, and by new software, I mean software signed on or after June 1st of 2019. So we're going to go into detail on what we mean by both of those things, both the complete uh, and correct signing and the hardened runtime. So first, when you, to completely sign everything, you need to sign everything. That means bundles, macros, installer packages, wherever they are, whether you have macros in your installer packages, installer packages in your bundles, uh, anywhere that they're found in any place within your product, they need to be signed, uh, yeah, they need to be signed correctly. So to sign correctly, that means you have to uh, sign bundles, macros, and code, and I'll talk, talk more about code in a second, uh, with your developer ID application certificate, and be sure to include a secure timestamp. For executables, uh, they need to opt into the hardened runtime. You don't need to opt into the hardened runtime for dialibs or frameworks or bundles, just for executables. For installer packages, you need to sign them with your developer ID installer certificate. And this is different from your developer ID application certificate, so be careful. Also, if you choose to sign your disk images to avoid gatekeeper path randomization, then they, those must be signed with your developer ID application certificate and include a secure timestamp. So if you're using Xcode for building your package or your software, this is easy. Uh, if you turn on automatic so, uh, code signing, Xcode does all of this for you. Uh, but you have to be careful. If you use uh, script build phases or copy build phases, those might be introducing new code into your uh, software that Xcode doesn't know about. And so then you have to make sure that those get uh, correctly signed. So I mentioned uh, code files. So uh, when we introduced code signing a number of years ago, uh, we documented in the tech note that there are these things called code places. So any files found in any of these places within their bundle are considered code by the code signing infrastructure. And that means they need to have an attached signature. Uh, Macos are the best for this. You can embed the signature inside of any Mako that you put in these places, as well as for bundles. Uh, but if you put other types of files, such as JPEGs or uh, raw binary files, those have to be signed as well. Uh, but they don't get an attached signature. Instead, the signature ends up in as, as an extended attribute. And that means that you have to be careful when you're packaging up your code to make sure that that extended attribute stays within those. To avoid having to be too careful with that, we recommend that you put anything that isn't a Mako or a bundle containing a Mako in a place other than any of these places when you're structuring your app. So to get signing right when you're doing it outside of Xcode, uh, we recommend what we call inside-out code signing. That means you sign the most deeply nested uh, bundle or uh, piece of code within your app first. And in this case, it would be the updater.app inside of the Sparkle framework, inside of the Watching Grass Grow app. And then you move up a level and sign each of the, the things individually. Note that when you sign the Sparkle framework by itself, or the Sparkle framework, that grabs the Sparkle's main executable as well as signing the updater.app together. Uh, and note you need to go individually to watch grass grow saver, grow grass.dilib, and watching grass grow helper. And finally, after you've signed all those, you sign everything together at the top bundle. And again, this will sign the main executable of your bundle as indicated by your info queue list. Some of you use the dash dash deep flag in your custom workflows, but you need to be careful. Uh, the dash dash deep flag only looks for code in code places. And in this case, the, the grow grass dilib, the watching grass grow saver, and the updater.app uh, wouldn't be found as code. They would be signed in as resources, but they wouldn't be signed as code, and therefore they would be rejected by the notarization unless you took the extra steps to do the inside-out signing. And, and see TechNote 2206 for more information on inside-out signing and code places uh, after the talk. 